and we are live. Today is Thursday, October 22nd. I am so excited today on Everyday Leaders Personal Growth Live. I have invited our four-time Olympian, two-time gold medalist, Heather Moyes to join us as a follow-up from the Everyday Leaders 50 and 50 podcast. And so I'm Melanie Ake. If you haven't figured out, if you haven't followed Everyday Leaders, um, this is kind of a theme, a brand, an energy around helping people to achieve things every day in their life with leadership principles. And so uh, I am pulling in a lot of people into this group to just help us get inspired about our life. And so, Heather, I met you real quick. I met you at a John Maxwell Live to Lead private mm -hmm. conference that we were having. Mm -hmm. And I came up and I said, oh, my goodness, I have to know you in my life. <laughs> and you were so gracious. You were getting ready to do some big things. And you said, here's my card, here's my phone number. And I, I said, would you please at some point come and share your story? And you just said, absolutely. So so thank you this very much. This is so much. great. Melanie, it's so great to be here. Oh, really I, I just love you. So if you guys haven't listened to the podcast on Facebook, I posted our um, our Everyday Leader podcast that we did together a few weeks ago. So go listen to that. And then really the challenge is today, if you have a question for Heather, if you haven't done this before, put it in the chat because we want to make sure we answer all of your questions because mm -hmm. there are some exciting things that are happening here. So Heather, yes. <laughs> I'm going to shut up as Joe would say. <laughs> <laughs> no. This is just really awesome to have you here. Um, so if you're watching this uh, on your phone or on the computer, you can go also and follow us at heathermoyes.com because um, this is this is what our challenge is all about. So, yeah, Heather, thank yes. you for joining us today. Oh, my gosh. No, thank you for having me. This is so fun. It, it is so fun. And and so when I posted this, that you were joining us and people wanted to ask questions about what an Olympian feels like, what it is, what your challenges have been like to just go through, you know, the process. How do you even decide that you want to take on a challenge like this? And, uh, and so that's where I kind of want to open it up because I know you've got a huge story to share. Yeah, there are a lot of, lot of stories that could be kind of melded into one, one big story. So you might have to tell me to just zip it and stop talking if I get on a ramble. Um, I didn't start pursuing the Olympics uh, until I was 27. So my whole life I played sports, but I grew up in the smallest province in Canada. So the island right off the East Coast accessible only by plane or a you know 13 kilometer bridge now which used to be a 45 minute boat ride when I was growing up so you know kind of small pond and even though you excel there there weren't people around me training for the Olympics so in my immediate environment Olympians were TV people you know those were people you'd watch on TV they weren't everyday normal people like I considered myself to be so it's not that I actively thought I couldn't do it. It's just that it didn't occur to me as a possibility. So I just played sports my whole life and just for fun, never took it seriously. And um, yeah, I grew up in an academic family. So, you know, pursued a career and a master's degree in occupational therapy. And then when I was 27, I was kind of faced with this challenge of seeing if I could um, qualify for the national bobsled team and compete in the next Olympic games, which were five months away. So it was a a very big challenge. No, and wait a minute. I, We've been in COVID. Like we have been shut down more than five months. So yes. you're telling me that from March 13th, if you had this challenge, that you can go to the Olympics. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> that you decided, yeah. okay, I'm going to do it. <laughs> yeah, this was at the end. The testing was the end of February. Um, and I ended up just, I ended up really going because a recruiter was trying to convince me to do this. And four years earlier, he was trying to convince me and I just said, no, I wasn't interested. You know, my goals weren't aligned. I wanted to work in a developing country. So I had um, just accepted a position to go and do development work down in Trinidad and Tobago. And I was pursuing my dream. Like I didn't grow up dreaming about going to the Olympics. So it wasn't something that um, it, it just was kind of a non-decision at the time. And then four years later, when he was just so insistent, and I was like, oh, my goodness, okay, I'll just go to the testing camp. It's not like I'm really going to do this, but, you know, we'll see what happens. And I go to the testing camp, and um, I ended up breaking one of their testing records. And all of a sudden, I was like, wait a second. You mean to tell me that I have broken a record amongst all these athletes who've been training years, 
and who are supposed to be representing us in five months at the Olympics. Hmm. Uh, I wonder, can I learn a new sport? Can I learn to do it well? And can I learn to do it well enough in five months in order to represent my country at the upcoming games? So, I mean, I did not fall in love with bobsledding because I hadn't even seen a bobsled yet. It was all dry land testing. I hadn't been down a track yet. I could have hated it. Mm -hmm. um, but I was presented with this challenge that really just, the challenge is what motivated me, you know, probably because of how highly unlikely it was, you know, or implausible it seemed for that, uh, for that actually to happen. But it was just the, I don't know, it was, it was just a challenge that I couldn't give up. So I realized then that even though I'd kind of been sort of drifting through life, like still doing the things that I thought I was supposed to be doing, you know, kind of progressing to the next and going, doing my undergrad and then going to, you know, then all the next stages. Um, I realized then that I'm really truly motivated and fueled by challenges and by, you know, pro sometimes proving people wrong, proving to people that things can be done, proving to people that if you actually believe in the possibilities, not the guarantees, if you believe in the possibilities, that's when you actually discover what you're truly capable of. So it's been really, um, it's been really amazing, partly because my story is so different from so many other Olympians and starting so late, it allows me to have a different perspective that I can help my clients with and help people with. And I just, it's, I love it. I love changing, seeing those wheel, wheels turn, you know, changing people's, the way they're thinking about something. And it's really fun. Well, and I love your story because it's never too late right? That's the no. message for people like right now, they're thinking, I'm having trouble with figuring out what I want to do next, my company's closed, or I have mm -hmm. to shift and I have to make this big change in my life, my kids are going yeah. to school, I'm having to teach them different things. But here's the thing, right? It's never too late to do something if you are opened a door, and somebody shows you there is a possibility mm -hmm. for this. That's what your story is so encouraging from the heart. Now I have to share your book right? Yeah. Redefining Yay. realistic. So the forward by John Maxwell, give a little shout out there. Uh, because there are things about mindset, mm -hmm. right? And so many people when I said, Hey, I'm going to bring Heather on live, they had all these questions for you, just about how you stay consistent, like you've reached this goal. And you've become this Olympian, this this world Olympian champion, twice gold, mm -hmm. four times just being able to be in the Olympics. And then you think, so what do you, how do you sustain that like champion mindset? You know, our, our one of my favorite friends, our favorite quote is play like a champion, right? At, mm -hmm. at Notre Dame. And we're always talking about that. But the mindset of a champion, that's so different than just going and doing it one time. It is. Yeah. I mean, just winning is one thing, but I think that being a champion is more than just winning once. It's kind of the way you live your life, the way you um, pursue goals and being a champion doesn't necessarily mean being a leader either. Um, I think that those are very different things. I think that, well, first of all, I think everyone is a leader or role model to begin with because they're being watched or observed or noticed by people around them. And so you're making an impact, whether you want to be or not, you're making an impact. Um, it's just how you choose to make that impact is whether you're, you know, kind of embracing the fact that you're a leader or not. Um, but being a champion and that champion mindset, I think that um, a lot of people uh, kind of equate that to perseverance and, you know, dedication and all of those things. For me, I think that the biggest part, that is part of it, but I think the biggest part is um, when you get faced with challenges, what are you doing? Like, what, what, where is your mind? when you're being faced with challenges and, and what's going through your head and where your thoughts. And that's kind of what you kind of need to train in order to keep yourself back on track. Now, uh, a big part of it is intentional decision-making and not just uh, going with the flow and not just making decisions um, because you think that's what you're supposed to be making or the, the things you should be doing. Um, because one of the quotes in my book, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Uh, and I think that a lot of us need to kind of adopt that. We often live making our decisions based on what we feel we should be doing and not necessarily reflective of our core values and what's really important to us. A lot of people set goals that um, that aren't actually reflective of what's truly important to them or what they truly enjoy, or they're setting goals that they think they're, they should be setting or that they want to be setting. And if they're 
reason, if their root why is not deep enough ingrained in what they actually truly want, then they'll never be able to stay consistent. They'll never be able to stay on track because they don't really want to. Like deep down, it's not something that they truly value. So it's the kind of the, I guess the, the background work before you even start pursuing the goal, that's kind of the most important thing that's going to, I guess, dictate whether or not people are going to be able to kind of withstand that amount of time. So mm -hmm. it's really interesting. And there are different strategies when you're faced with challenges. And um, there have been studies done that show uh, people like successful people kind of in anything, whether it's just in pursuing one goal or in business or whatever, if they're confronted with a challenge within 60 seconds, they're already trying to think of a solution. So the difference is that a lot of people when faced with a challenge, they might be wallowing in the fact that things aren't going smoothly. Why does this have to happen? You know, and just kind of woes me like, oh, this sucks. And you know, all of that stuff. But um, if you can train your mind to say, okay, assume that you can be successful, assume that there's a way. So already within 60 seconds, you should be trying to find that way. So it's, that's just one little, one little trick. Yeah. Well, and, and I think it's different for everybody, right? Because it's different for everybody. when you start a challenge, you think, okay, well, can I do this? And do I have everything ready? Like I have to have it perfect before I can start this challenge. And I think that's where, you know, when we, when you and I talk so much and, it, and it's about, can you physically, you know, get your mindset ready and, and around, like, what is that going to look like next? Mm -hmm. Right. So seeing the future saying in 90 days, I'd like for this to happen. Take exercise. Right. It's so easy to do mm -hmm. in 90 days. I'd like to be like this on the scale or I want to look like this or I want to get into this yeah. dress or I want to compete in the Olympics. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so, so you've got to see the end in mind before mm -hmm. you can go backwards. Right. And and be really strategic on what it's going to take you to get to that next step. But you also have to know why you're doing it. It's not just about, okay, in 90 days, I want to lose this amount of weight. Well, why? Why do you want to, why do you feel you need to lose that amount of weight? And then when you get that answer, it's usually a follow up answer. Well, yeah, but why is that important? Mm -hmm. Why is that important to you? Not society, not social media, not Instagram or Facebook. Why is that truly important to you? Because if it's just for appearance, if it's just for getting a number of likes, if it's just for that sort of thing, then it's it's very superficial. And there are underlying problems in terms of self-image and self-worth and self-value that are more important to deal with than simply losing weight on a scale. And if it's some people just equate losing weight to being healthy, well, I want to be healthier. Yes, but there are some very skinny people out there who are not healthy. So, you know, we're talking like, I think we need to really understand what we're what we're striving for. And sometimes and it all usually boils down to like your fourth or fifth level why and then it comes down to a feeling, like some kind of feeling of well, I want to feel like I'm this or I want to feel like I'm this and then maybe weight is part of it. But maybe it's not, mm -hmm. you know, it might actually be something completely different that you feel like you're lacking or that you're you're looking for in your life. And it's, it's really phenomenal when you kind of dig down to that and and then it's it's different you know losing weight might just be a fact of feeling energized and you know I feel sluggish all the time so I feel like I need to lose weight well maybe that's not really it at all maybe it's because you're watching tv until you know 12 o'clock or one o'clock in the morning you know maybe that's the thing that's holding you back so it's it's really interesting when you dive into it Mm -hmm. It's all about journaling, right? It's like if you have this idea in mind to start to figure out what does the map look like? What's the mind map yeah. look like? Um, I have a quick question here uh, from yeah. Anza. She wants to know what sacrifices um, did you have to make to reach your goal? It's a great question, isn't it? It is a great question. There's actually, uh, it's interesting. I'm just going to do a little side note, Anza. I hope you're okay with this. Side note, I wrote... Um, in my book, I included this article that I had read a while ago, um, and it was written by, oh my goodness, now I'm sharing it, now I can't remember the guy's name. <laughs> I'll get back to you. Um, it was literally about what are you willing, it was all about what, it's not what do you want, it's what are you willing to sacrifice to get it. So John actually says this too, John Maxwell. He says, a lot of people want to get to where I am, like be doing what I'm doing. A lot of people want to do what I do 
but they don't want to do what I did to mm -hmm. get here. And that is so powerful because people just see, uh, I mean, sure, I'm sure everyone would want to be an Olympic gold medalist. I'm sure everyone would want to have a million dollars and be CEO of a company. I'm sure everyone would want to be a rock star, you know, on stage in front of thousands and thousands of people. I'm sure everyone, but if they knew that living on the road meant they don't get to see their families or they're not home for holidays. If they knew that to be a CEO or to be a millionaire, that meant like for three years, you were literally sleeping at the office under your desk because you had to be there like constantly working and, you know, having kind of no life. And if that meant you don't get to see your family ever and you never get home for family dinners. And if you, you know what, it's true. It comes down to sacrifice. It comes down to choices. I want to say not so much sacrifice because they, are intentional choices, it, they should be intentional choices that you're making. Mm -hmm. um, and when you do the work to lay out proper goal setting, when you set your goal down and you figure out everything that is involved in getting there, then when you see it all laid out and you put it into a timeline and everything is laid out and you're like, okay, whoa, <laughs> whoa, this is what it's gonna be like, then you can actually evaluate whether it's a goal you really want to pursue or not. Like, do you really want a million dollars but have no life and have seen none of your family? Do you really want to be an Olympic champion if it means putting your body through some sometimes some pretty painful things and also missing birthdays and, you know, holidays? And, you know, sometimes it's a matter of putting your life on hold for a certain amount of time. So those are the kind of evaluation questions that people should be asking every time they set a goal. Mm -hmm. uh, now, to answer your question directly for me, things that I sacrificed, um, uh, obviously some birthdays and, and stuff, but sometimes that you're just missing family birthdays if you live in a different part of the country. So that's not that bad. Even if you live down the street, right? <laughs> uh, well, true, true. And now during COVID, we could just wave through a window. So everything, everything's quite different now. Um, but there there was probably the i would say there are two big things one kind of uh incident um and then one just kind of a general and the one incident was i missed one of my best friend's weddings one of her weddings she had one wedding i missed one <laughs> one best friend her wedding there you go <laughs> not one of her multiple weddings she only had one um so she, that, was, that was a strange use of words. Um, but anyway, I missed her wedding and it was really, it was a hard decision. Um, it was held in the fall, actually probably around now. And it was, it wasn't even a, because of a bobsled race. It was because of um, preseason training. But that training just happened to be in the fall of 2009 on the Whistler track, right at the start of the season leading up to the Vancouver Olympic Games. And so it was kind of a, she's still gonna be my best, like she's still gonna be one of my best friends when this is done. I'm still gonna get to see photos. It's gonna, I'm gonna hate that I'm not gonna be there, but she is going to understand. Will I regret this, will I not? If it was a, a, a sick parent, then I would have missed the training camp 100% because you don't know what those, you don't know what the follow-ups are, you, anything can happen. Mm -hmm. um, but a wedding, that's really just a party. It's an event, it's a celebration. I can celebrate that every year on an anniversary with her, you know, that sort of thing. So for me, it was really unfortunate to have to miss it, but it was an intentional choice and I don't regret it in the least. Um, and she certainly doesn't regret me missing it, especially since we won in Vancouver. <laughs> uh, she's happy about that. She says, you just go and I'll just play with your medal. That's fine. I'll just wear it around every, every once in a while. We're, and we'll be even, that'll be, that'll work out. <laughs> so I said, okay, great. That's a good deal. Uh, the other thing that I would say in terms of um, sort of sacrifice a little bit is that I feel like when you're on tour for bobsledding, because you're literally away and on tour. So I would go probably for preseason August September of this of this of the year, um, and then preseason a little bit of training in September. I would usually go in September, and then October there'd be ice on the track, so we'd start sliding, and then either the end of October or start of November we would be starting to travel for races, mm -hmm. and we'd get home maybe for a week or so at Christmas, maybe five days, sometimes ten, depending on the season, and then we'd be gone again. And it just, 
it kind of feels like like I was removed from real life. I so so now uh, I feel like I'm the same age I was before I started in 2005. Mm -hmm. So I still feel like I'm 27 and not 42. And it's a very weird concept to wrap my head around. Um, but before going back to Pyeongchang, for example, when that when that rookie asked me if I would come back and kind of help with leadership on the team and and anyway, it was a big decision for me to put my business on hold and to go back, but it also aligned with exactly what my business stands for. And so I did go back, but part of that decision making was, do I not only want to put my business on hold, but do I want to put my life on hold really for the next, for another year? Mm -hmm. And that's, I think a bit of a, that's kind of where the challenging decisions come in place as to whether or not I could do that or not. And it was really, it was a really tough decision, but I did it and happy I did it and and yeah, but there are some sacrifices that But come you know, it. but what they recognized in you was you had done this and so now it was your turn to go back and really inspire people and really coach them and really right pour into the things that you knew yeah. how to do best. And that's It was really strange, yeah. Melanie. It was because the my former teammate with whom I had won gold in Vancouver and Sochi, she asked me in March, so almost a year before the Pyeongchang games, she had asked me if I would go back and compete with her and I said no, not interested. Love my business. I don't need to prove to the world that, you know, that I'm the best in the world again. Like I just, I don't feel that need to kind of just rack up a bunch of medals. Um, it was always just, if it was a, each, each Olympic games kind of presented me with a very different challenge and just doing the same thing to kind of just prove myself again, just it didn't light me up. So I just loved helping other people. It was almost like their goals became my goals. And so I was now moved on to being infused with the excitement of helping other people and I loved it. And so I said, no. And then in the spring, the coaches contacted me and asked if I would be interested in going back. And I said, no, I'm perfectly, like I love what I'm doing. I'm perfectly happy, thank you. Um, and then in August of 2017, so only six months before the Pyeongchang games, that's when I received an Instagram message from an up and coming driver and she was, she introduced herself. I'd never met her before. She introduced herself and then said that there was a lack of leadership in the program, that besides my former teammate, um, who had to focus on her own path to success, not one other person in the women's program had ever been to an Olympic Games before. And that she'd heard from the coaches that, um, that the Olympic season is different from any other season in terms of the pressures and stresses. And like, it's, it's really challenging. Just the season itself, not, not even the competition, but the, the mindset, the mindset piece that goes into being able to execute what you're physically able to execute. Um, so I found that fascinating. I was just, I mean, yes, she wanted me to push. <laughs> like it was just, it was physical, like I physically had to get back into sh shape and, um, and see if my body would even allow me to do something like that again. Um, but a lot of it was dealing with the stresses and pressures of competing at such a high level. So it was really, it was, it was fun. Again, that, that turned it into a different challenge for me, you know, intentionally going back. And, and I mean, I, I said, I wasn't just going back to push for that one girl who asked me. Um, but I made sure that the Bobsled Federation agreed that I wasn't going back to push for my former teammate just to try and win another medal. I was going back, I would push any rookie. I would push any person who had never competed in the Olympic games before. Um, I was there to invest in the next generation and to help them with that mindset piece and, and whatever they needed. And so it was, it was really great. It was really fun. It's yeah. so neat to hear you transition through that because I think all of us have done that at some point, you know, we talk about leadership and success versus significance. Mm -hmm. And so you just kind of walk through that path of saying, okay, I did this. I know how to do it the right way. I see that there's a gap and I can really add value here. Yeah. And, you know, some people say, oh, add value. That's just such a, it's just a term. It's overused, right? But mm. when you know as a leader that that's what you're doing, that's why you're showing up, it is completely different. And you go in and you, and you really do uh, stand in a different mindset because you, you, were, you were just there saying, I'm confident. I know exactly the purpose that I'm here. And so you're not going in there with a, 
I hate to say athletes aren't competitive because you are competitive. Oh, very competitive. But yeah. it's a it's to compete to win for everybody, mm. right? It's interesting because, I mean, I was saying that I wasn't motivated by the idea of just going back to the Olympics to try and win a third Olympic medal, but I was motivated by the idea of going back to help someone else get to the Olympics and potentially win their first. So by me trying to be my best, it was to help get someone else as close as they could to, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it was just, it was really neat because the amount of comments that I received and the media for that particular decision, um, some people absolutely loved it, could not get over the fact that I would turn down, especially since I tested as the fastest brake in Canada again, like you would normally automatically be put with the fastest driver, like mm -hmm. the best driver. So it was, it kind of shook things up a little bit and it was um it was very not only empowering for me but it was empowering to a lot of other people to stand up to other people's definition of success you know and to start being able to question that um and to start making other people question themselves and that i found i found very powerful there was one guy on the bobsled team when i got back and they were like they're like brothers basically. And he was like, oh my gosh, it's so great to have you back. But you know, you're gonna end up pushing your former teammate, don't you? And I said, no, I'm, no, I'm not. And they said, yeah, they're gonna make you. And I'm like, okay, I'm a redhead in case you haven't noticed, I, they can't make me do anything. But that is just, and not just redheads, nobody can make anybody do anything. So for me, it was, it, I just looked at him and I said, no, I am, they, they can't actually make me do anything. He says, what are you gonna do, leave? I said, yes, I would leave. And I've already told them, I said, this is, I'm coming back. If you want my help in the Federation, if you want me to help these younger athletes and you know, if you want me to push anybody at all and compete at all, then this is what I'm doing. And I don't usually kind of make stands like that. So it was very, there, I mean, the Federation was totally fine with it because usually I'm the one kind of building the Federation up and I'm not used to kind of, I don't want to say making demands, but this was my reason for coming back. And I just said, I don't need another, I don't need a fourth Olympic games. I don't need a third Olympic medal. So if it becomes like a, um, if it becomes a choice or an ultimatum, mm -hmm. then I would, I'm going to be, I would be happy to, to leave and you guys can, you know, Used other people to push so it was amazing it was really and the guy kind of looked at me going oh my god like i guess we wow we do have choice like we do have a say in what we do with ourselves and sometimes we might feel that we don't but we always do mm -hmm. and when we kind of can acknowledge the fact that everything we do from the color of socks we put on in the morning to the university we choose to go to to whether we go to university or not or the career path we choose um sometimes it might not feel like a choice uh but it's always a choice. It's so always it's a choice. Always a choice. Well, and always you talk about getting backed up against the wall, right? You have one opportunity or somebody says, I really see you here for this purpose. Mm -hmm. But you're like, that's really not why I'm here. It's not why I'm here. And yeah. so you, you have to be able to be, have that confidence to stand up and say, no, you either want me to do this role, mm -hmm. this is what I believe, or, you know, I have to leave. And yeah. so that's that's kind of the you get to that leadership epiphany, I think, and knowing what your purpose and your real value purpose, is. Your why. It's knowing the reason for doing something. And my reason for going back was not to do anything to win a gold medal. My reason for going back was to invest in the next generation and to hopefully get these younger athletes in the best mindset so they can actually physically execute what they are physically able to execute when the pressure's at its highest. So you kind of... I mean, throughout the season, as a competitive athlete, you know, the whole tempting, like knowing how close we could be and knowing you get kind of caught up in that, but mm -hmm. it's coming back down to being true and what you'd regret later if you changed paths and realize that, you know, you change because of the societal sway mm -hmm. and not because you're staying true to who you are. So it's a, it was a constant check-in, but it was, it was amazing. It was a great and I believe I spoke at the John Maxwell event uh, right before, like that was that fall. Mm -hmm. That was, was probably a month after I made the decision. 
Yeah. You were getting back. ready to go right into it. And so yes. it was really neat because, you know, with John, it, anytime you're with John, <laughs> he just, he pulls it out of you. And the, and the funny thing is you were like, okay, these are the expectations that I have. But then when you mm -hmm. experienced it, to be able to come back and talk about that, uh, I just love it because you're real, right? People will say, well, you're an Olympian. You want to be on a box of Wheaties and, <laughs> you know, all these things that you were looking forward to. And, and it was about giving back the next time. So mm -hmm. I have a, a quick question that I want to put up here yes. from um, Dr. Jeff Van Vailer. And here's his question for you. So... If you want to read that. Yeah. And running toward doing your best to achieve your gold medals and the World Rugby Hall of Fame, has there been any element of running away? Do we mean leaving the sport? I, I don't know about clarification. Uh, I Do think mean... uh, mindset. Mindset. Anything that you were running away from as you were becoming a champion. I think that's an interesting your question. To achieve your gold medals in the World Rugby Hall of Fame. Has there been any element of running away? Uh, you mean running away from something and kind of using sport as a? I don't. I don't know. Um, to be honest, I don't think so. Yeah. I used. Um, I mean, I always had just considered sport to be extracurricular to what I was going to do to earn a living. So growing up, I mean, I played sports my whole life, but it was always just for fun. And so I'd never actually started lifting weights or taking it seriously until I was 27, like I mentioned before. And it was purely just because I was presented with this challenge. Um, now, the problem was at the time that it was right in the middle of my master's degree, you know, in occupational therapy. So it's usually a two year professional degree. And so I had to go like after the first year and apply to see if they would let me take a one year leave of absence to just try bobsledding. And they were like, what what like what happened um where did bob sledding come from and i'm like i don't know um so for me it kind of started off as a challenge and then when you come forth at the olympic games i went back and finished my master's degree the next year but that fourth place kind of haunts you a little bit and it feels a bit like unfinished business and it presents with a different challenge of instead of just representing my country can i actually win a medal for my country and the next games being on home soil you know it kind of prompts this like hmm i wonder if i can do it and so the, it, the fourth place kind of fueled the challenge of competing in vancouver and then after vancouver i was kind of done the rugby world cups kind of happened intermittently the 2010 rugby world cup uh, the 2006 Rugby World Cup after Torino, and then the 2010 Rugby World Cup. Now, after 2014, I had actually competed in the 2013 Sevens Rugby Tournament, the uh, World that um, World Cup, the Sevens World Cup. But that was probably, I mean, I loved competing in it, but that was a struggle. I had had hip surgery six months, I think, before that mm -hmm. tournament. And I mean, although I physically had gotten back, my cardio was not uh, where it needed to be for a sevens tournament. So it was a little bit of a struggle. And so I couldn't play as assertively as I normally would have. So that led right into the 2014 games. And then after the 2014, I just, I think I was done. Like, I, I just was like, okay, because they were asking me about rugby for the Olympics and Rio and and I'm just like, I don't want to move to Vancouver. Like, I feel like I was being pulled in a lot of different directions. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I just made that decision. No, I'm like, I, I just I just need to not be away and not be on the road anymore. Um, well, in terms of the Rugby Hall of Fame. You know, you're multi-talented here. You have just a natural gift, right? Yeah. Sometimes, though, it makes it, it makes I, I, I kind of think I understand where the question's coming from. I don't know that it was running away per se. I think for a long time, it wasn't intentional choice. Mm -hmm. um, rugby, I played my whole life because I, I loved rugby, like kind of on and off, played in different countries when I lived in Trinidad, when I lived in Ireland. You know, I just loved it. And um, I kind of just stumbled into the national rugby team. I know that sounds a little crazy, but... Um, at first, I didn't even know we had a national women's rugby team. So when I was growing up and playing at university, and then after university, I find out that I've been long listed. And I was like, to what? Mm -hmm. You know, and they said, the national women's rugby team. And I was like, oh, my, we have a national women's rugby team. What? <laughs> like, it was, it was crazy. So it's mm -hmm. not, I never grew up pursuing these things. So I wasn't using these as an outlet, I don't think, to run away from anything. 
Um, but I do think that an element of, of competing, not an element of competing, but I guess a consequence mm. of competing um, is that, like I mentioned before, it almost feels like my life was put on hold, mm -hmm. but yet life was still happening while I was away doing these things. And that's, it's been a, it's been a strange and interesting thing for me to process now, especially while I'm coaching other people. It's kind of an interesting uh, element to bring into the conversation. I do remember in high school, I was playing soccer, basketball, rugby, track and field. And at one point, I thought I was going to quit all of them. Um, and not quitting because I wasn't doing well, but just literally choosing to no longer play because I felt like I was being pulled in every direction. I felt like I didn't even know what I was enjoying anymore. I didn't even know if I was enjoying sports or whether I was only playing because of, out of a sense of obligation. Mm -hmm. Like I felt like, That's okay, I know. Point. That is a great I know point. that I'm, it's a great, it's, and I think that a lot of us need to question that in, in a lot of things that we do. Mm -hmm. But I was just like, am I just doing this because I mean, I know, and this is this hopefully doesn't come out wrong, but I know the team will need me to do as well as they can, like to do their best. Or I know that, um, I don't know. It just it's it's hard when when you feel like a lot of people are relying on you, mm -hmm. and you don't know whether you're doing it anymore because you actually genuinely love it, or whether again, like I said, a sense of obligation. So part of uh, and I'm sure that that, even though it initially started with that love for challenges, part of it, especially with the the leader, like coming back and um, and helping with the rookies, even going towards Pierre, Pyeongchang, I have to kind of acknowledge that there probably was a little piece of that in there, that feeling of like, well, if I'm the only one who can help, then maybe I need to do this. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of why even now grappling with that idea of, you know, of sacrifice, of what am I willing to do, of whether it was an intentional choice or kind of a pull sense of obligation. So there's there's a lot of that. And so I don't know that it was running away to answer your question, but I do think that part of that consequence is like, you know, doing it out of, uh, and I won't say all of it, because some of it I loved and I would never change anything for the world, but It's yeah. just making those intentional decisions. You know, I think- a lot of times we just, we start living, right? A lot of mm -hmm. times we're in a business and we just say, I'm just doing this because this is what I know, well, this yeah. is what and I'm I, good at. And what I've realized is that even though we are making, we do, you know, you can sit things down and you do make intentional choices. What I've discovered, especially work with working with clients, is that we tend to make our decisions and even set our goals within the boundaries of our immediate environment or surroundings or experiences. So it's just it's just fascinating. Like we will still think that we're making these choices, but you're only setting your goals into what you what you have brought up to believe is realistic or as possible, which is why I wrote the book called Redefining Realistic because we need to redefine that, you know, just because like how many people become teachers because their parents were teachers or how many people become doctors because their parents were doctors or you know because that's they know that it's possible right they know it's possible because their parents have been doing it so that's and kind of a model the right there's a model to show them the way and exactly and it's the same thing with athletes how many olympic or professional athletes out there pursued it that seriously because they had a parent or an aunt and uncle or someone in their immediate surroundings who did it i mean i didn't pursue it like i said when i was growing up because those were TV people, right. right? Those that wasn't part of an intentional decision. I just never considered it because that's not my environment. That's not in my immediate. So what's really interesting is there's a story I share in my book, and it's about my nephew. Um, when he was four, like four, almost five. Now I have to explain. He's he's gene like genetically he's gifted as well athletically gifted and I would say probably like the male version of what I was growing up so it's watch out uh, <laughs> but anyway he is um when he was four he was before he turned five I think uh or maybe just turned five he uh had to go and get a surgery just he had to get some skin removed from an infection and after that you could just like within the next couple of days 
you could see he was a little bit quiet. And so, you know, my sister said, you know, is everything okay? Like what's going on? And he said, no, everything's okay. And he was tough, tough little kid, like wasn't upset about it or anything, but he just said, but so because I had the skin removed, does that mean, um, does that mean that I'll compete in the other Olympics? And my sister was like, what other Olympics? He goes, you know, the ones, the ones where people compete when part of their body's missing. And so this is coming from like a four or five year old. And my sister said, the Paralympics? And he said, yeah, would I be competing in that one or the one Auntie competed in? And so by that time, I had already competed in three, I think, three games. And so the, that's not uh, like a cocky statement for, or an arrogant statement for a young child. It was just a very matter of fact. Like he knows it, in his environment, he knows it's possible to go to the Olympic games. Just like his mom, my sister, is a doctor. So if he he knows that it's possible to become, you know, a physician or an emergency doctor because it's there. And it's just, I think we need to open the minds of kids who don't have parents who are necessarily doing all these different jobs or these different things just so that they can be, realize the possibilities that are out there and redefine realistic. Just because it's not in your immediate environment does not mean that it's not possible for you. It just, I, I don't know. It was just that whole, that, that whole scenario with my nephew just lit it up and saying, well, he just, it wasn't, he wasn't upset about which one he would go to. It was very matter of fact. He just wanted to know which one, you know, which one would he be going to now? And it never crossed his mind that it was not possible for him to go. And that's, I think the part that we need to kind of like latch onto is we need to believe in those possibilities and, and pursue the possibilities because there really are no guarantees in anything. There so. aren't any guarantees. And and that's what you talk about so much in this. And I, I want to mm -hmm. make sure, um, you know, for people that have just kind of jumped on here, uh, this book, Redefining Realistic uh, by Heather, I also want to go to your website because there are some things that I want to not miss. I, there's a lot of questions that we have on here. But oh, the, <laughs> the thing is, um, you have started. So when we think about athletic mind, we think about mm -hmm. challenges that mm -hmm. um that we do for ourselves, right? We and, and you said five months you had, six months to get to the Olympics. And so you had to figure out like what that was going to look like every single day, how you were going to mm -hmm. keep accountable and committed to this. Yes. And so yeah. you, through COVID, told me that you had all these events. And so all these people that are speakers and trainers mm -hmm. and coaches said, you know, the live events got turned off this year mm -hmm. completely. Yeah. So you had to figure out what realistic looked like for you. Yes. And so you decided to start your own little challenge mm -hmm. to, to start something different. And so I want you to talk a little bit about what that is. And I'm going to go through some of these questions as well while you're uh, yes. telling us about this. Yes. Yeah, so um, basically, it's something that I had been thinking about even pre-COVID. Um, and I've been wanting to do more coaching because I... I only kind of historically only ever took one or two private clients at a time because because of my schedule I didn't want to um, overrun myself or not be able to provide quality to to any of my clients so I just took one or two uh, private clients and and then everything else was just on the road living on the road on the road on the road all the time so I basically um, kind of COVID gave me the opportunity to not travel now mind you my whole speak the whole speaking business is now on the back burner we have no idea what's happening with that or when that'll start up again um but i created the you pursuit it was kind of an opportunity to do this now i didn't launch it until just recently partly because i mean a little bit out of respect with what was happening with COVID. i found that early on especially in the spring it was i just felt that the that online that the internet was kind of saturated with a lot of uh maybe not genuine offers for for help and assistance um from people who might not have been qualified and so I just kind of took a step back and it gave me the opportunity to kind of breathe and take it in and figure out if it's exactly what I wanted um and I did so I created the U Pursuit now right now it's it's on my website as a 10-week program um but I may actually evolve that Right now, the group is going on right now. That's going on right now. It's actually quite fun, and the goals are quite varied, and which makes it really interesting because it kind of lets people see um, the process of goal setting 
not just not just what it has to do with theirs, but now it's a small it's a small group. I won't take any more than ten, maybe twelve if I needed to. But the smaller the group, the better. So um, it's been really really great, and people are learning also from how um, I guess from how each other. Uh, are are breaking goals down because then it's applicable to everything. When you actually learn the proper techniques and goal setting and how to break that down into you know your sub goals and then breaking those sub goals down into actionable steps and then identifying your milestones and putting it on a timeline so you can literally break things down. I think a lot of a lot of the time why people don't pursue their goals is because they seem overwhelming. So they seem way too big, way too overwhelming. But just like pursuing the Olympic Games, if you knew what we did on a daily basis, it would just seem super mundane. Now, I do acknowledge that there are athletes out there who maybe like to portray themselves as uh, doing more than than is required than than they have actually done, and making it seem like you can do it, but yet explaining it in a sense that seems implausible for anyone to do. Um, but if you really broke it down and saw the actionable steps that happen every day and just look at things every day, then that's the key to, it's like literally you're just checking the box and doing what you need to do every day to get to where you want to go. And so by, by learning the process on how to break that stuff down, it really becomes, oh, well, this is all I have to do this week or this is all I have to do tomorrow or this is all I have to get done and you know, it just makes something that seems very implausible suddenly seems so actionable. And so, you know, anyway, it's, it's, it's really fun. So the first part of the course, the first half of it is really, it's really kind of heavy on the breaking things down and, and figuring out how many, breaking it down to the smallest of actionable steps um, and figuring that stuff, doing a SWOT analysis to figure out your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats that might, prevent you from achieving those, uh, from achieving the goal you've set for yourself. And then the second half kind of tackles a little more of that champion mindset. And so knowing that even though you have this plan in place, life happens and things come up and suddenly you're not just, uh, you know, you don't just work at the corner store. You're now homeschooling your kids because of COVID or, you know, how does all of this stuff happen? Because we know it's going to happen. So if you plan for the inevitable challenges that are going to pop up, then it's kind of figuring out how to deal with those and um, and developing that mindset that's going to help you get past that and how to get you back on track and how to, you know, implement strategies along the way that will help you get there. And yeah, it's been really fun. It's been really, really great. It's been awesome to to really watch you develop this because I think, you know, as coaches, people that have it within them to help that you mm -hmm. want to say, okay, I see something that you can't see. And if you can just be that, that cheerleader to say, well, you can be a champion, right? I know. And it's been, and I do, I do realize that um, I feel very blessed because my family ha is an incredible support system. Um, but I've realized, and you know, when I grew up, I thought everybody, I thought that's what everybody's family was. I thought everybody had supportive parents and siblings who cheered for you. And I, when I left, I think we all grew up thinking your family unit is what everyone's family unit is like. Right. And when I left and I found out that that probably was my advantage, you know, if I had an edge or an advantage for competing, it was because my parents could have cared less if I was doing sports or not. Right. My parents could have cared less if I won a gold medal or not. They just, they were thrilled and happy that I was able to do something that I enjoyed doing or that I was pursuing something that I loved or that I, you know, can make a career right now doing something that I'm passionate about and helping other people. So for them, it was like, there was no pressure from my parents to perform at any point in time, any pressure from my parents, it has to do with me as a person and how I carry myself and my integrity. And, you know, they were raising a human with like, they weren't raising an athlete, or they weren't raising, you know, those sorts of things. So it's, it's been that was the blessing that they didn't care so much about sports, that it really didn't matter. Now they were super supportive, but their support was in a way that it didn't matter. You know, it didn't matter what, what they did. So um, I just have to say something, especially for parents out there and especially for, you know, people who are raising young athletes or raising young humans who are competing in sports. Um, 
my parents, for example, were going to fly to Calgary, um, my very, the very first World Cup race for bobsledding. And, uh, and again, they had to, they had to book their tickets for the Olympic games that were five months later without knowing if I was even like going to go. And so I said, I don't know, you're going to fly all the way out to Calgary to watch a race, but I don't even know. I don't even know if I'll be racing. And they just said, Heather, you should know by now we're going to support you. We're not going to watch you. And so it's, takes the pressure away. Like I could have been sitting on the sidelines or I could have been the water girl at the rugby tournament or I could have been, and to them it didn't matter, right? They were there to support me and support what I chose to do and support the team. They weren't there to watch me perform. And to me, that was just like, it's a game changer. Like that that kind of mindset and, and peace is a game changer. And it allows you or me, it allowed me to just play without the pressure. So that was amazing. And then- yeah, I love that too. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's also been a blessing that my master's degree is in occupational therapy. So in occupational therapy, I'm academically trained to help people overcome their challenges. Now, I did a lot, a lot of work with neuro, with um, with neuro patients. So you know, post stroke or post traumatic brain injury and that sort of thing. But I also worked with kids, like all these different kind of rotations that we did. And um, it's just interesting how. I'm academically trained to do that, to help people achieve the goals that are important to them. And yet now I'm doing it in a completely different way, but it's the same. It's really, it's really interesting how, I mean, I even use some of the occupational therapy models when I'm helping people kind of work through things to figure out, you know, what's holding them back or how do you break something down just because you can't do it this way have you ever thought about doing it this way or, you know, raising these questions? And it's been really, it's been a blessing. It really, really has. All right. Here's a fun question. (laughs) Okay. Fun question. What did you want to, what did you want to do or eat once retired? Guilty pleasure. Oh, (laughs) Diane, (laughs) Diane, Diane, Diane. I have to say that um, if you're going to have guilt, then it's not a pleasure anymore. So uh, I probably am one of the most unorthodox Olympic athletes you might meet. I never restricted my diet. So, and there's some people on the team, um, one of the guys on the team used to tease me saying that walking into our, like our room, our hotel room, wherever we were, was like walking into a candy store. (laughs) So, I had candy on tour, even with rugby or, you know, soccer at university, I would be the, I would bring bags of candy and pass it up and down the bus when we're, you know, leaving a game or I just, um, to me, when I was training, I, I made sure that I added to my diet. I added, made sure that I was having enough protein. So I added a lot more protein shakes, which I just normally wouldn't have on a daily basis. I took a lot of um, like supplements, like my vitamins and minerals that, to be honest, I'm not taking right now. So it's it's those things that we probably should be taking every day, but that we don't. But at the time, it was my job. Um, so food is not a guilty pleasure for me because I just eat it. Like I eat it. Um, I just for some people who are uh, who are trying who have goals of kind of controlling those things that they're eating or like tapering those things down or for doing if weight loss is part of achieving their goal, which for me, it wasn't. But if it was for somebody, then, you know, then there are ways that I would talk about like cheat days or the worst things that you can do. And like, you know, different, like spiking your, you know, glucose levels and stuff like that. So we would work on things like that. But for me, food was never an issue. I just think for me, it was, I was just looking forward to like, literally when you are so physically active for so long, you just want to do nothing. So the thing that I craved, and especially because you're in the media all the time, you're in the spotlight all the time, you're doing all that stuff. The thing I craved, and again, not guilty. I do not feel guilty about it at all, but our cottage where I'm from, it's, and when I say cottage, I do not mean a summer home. I do not mean a summer home. I mean like a cabin, not no insulation, no TV, you know, there's not even, I mean, you can see the studs with the wires going, like we're talking rustic, um, but it's right in the woods and right on the water. And it's probably my favorite place on the planet. Um, no Wi-Fi, like we're talking in the woods and nobody can really reach you there. Like 
I mean, you, they can now because there's a bit more reception, but I mean, what I, what I craved more than anything was peace was like that was feeding chipmunks, like getting chipmunks up on my lap and feeding them with, you know, peanuts and sunflower seeds. And, um, that's really what I crave. So I don't know, guilty pleasure. Mm. I have a lot of pleasures like in terms of food, but I don't feel guilty about them. So <laughs> if you want specifics, like I, and it's not fancy. I don't love bakery treats. Like I, I don't love bakery. It's to me, it's like candy, like sour candies or Swedish berries or, or like McCain's deep and delicious cakes. Do you guys, do you have those in the States, Melanie? No, I don't know. Don't. Oh gosh. They're just a frozen cake. Like they're, they're not fancy, no fancy fillings in them. Just I don't know. I, it, I am popsicles all all day long. Popsicles. <laughs> See, we're all, everybody's thinking like, how do I now, eat like an athlete? Like, what do I do? So it's just yeah. like balance, right? It's just balance. I, I, for me, it was for me, it was a balance. Yeah. I just needed to make sure that my meals were super healthy and that I was getting all the nutrients I needed. But I was burning so many calories that I almost needed the empty sugar for me to burn, so that the actual nutrients I was getting from meals was going to my muscles to where I needed them to go. Right. Now, maybe that's something I justified in my brain. I don't know. There may be, that might just be my own, <laughs> you know, pseudo scientific explanation for that. But you're burning so many calories. And if weight wasn't an issue, there was actually one summer where I was training so much that I was doing double protein shakes because I was doing two training sessions a day. I always took two days off a week too. I took always no, not two days in a row, but always Thursday and a Sunday, just completely off. Um, but those, because I was training so much, I didn't really have time or to crave candy and sugars and mm -hmm. sweets. And I was actually flagged at the end of the summer, like going into the season. Um, I was called to the doctor's office and they said, we got your body comp results back. Um, and you're, you know, you've been flagged for concern. And they said, your muscle mass has gone up because that's the first summer that I wasn't dealing with an injury. So I could actually train. Um, and your body fat comp has gone down significantly. And so they were concerned because the less body fat you have, especially in a winter sport, mm -hmm. the more likely you are to get injured. Um, if you get sick and catch a cold, then you, it, instead of it, you just having a cold for five days, you could have it for three weeks because you can't get rid of it. Um, and in a contact sport, like in a sled, there's no, like nothing, no cushioning. So they were, they were like, whatever you were doing before, like, we don't have time to change your whole, to add like the oils and the fats and whatever to certain salad dressings and whatever. Um, they were just, they just said, okay, I, I feel weird telling you this as a physician, but you need to go back and eat some more sugar. Like you need something to kind of offset things and to get you back going. Cause it, it had kind of messed up with my system a little bit. Um, but it, it's, everybody's different. And for some people, they know that their performance is better at a certain, um, body fat level. Um, and so for some people, nutrition and food actually does make an impact. So they're a little more strict because they know they'll perform better at a lesser body fat. But my trainer also trained, he trains NHL hockey players, mo primarily NHL hockey players. And one of the, at the start of a the season, they told one of the players that he had to have his body fat comp lowered. There was now standard. And so my trainer was like, okay, well, we'll get your body fat comp down. So they got his body fat comp down and he played horribly when he showed up for tryouts. Like it was, it was like, what happened? So my trainer was like, let's put it back on. Like, let's get back up to close to where you were before. And it helped, like he was back playing the way he had been playing when he was recruited. So performance is affected by body fat comp and it's not, necessarily better just because you have a less body fat comp it depends on what you're you know you're not training for appearance or a bikini contest you're training for performance and so you just kind of have to keep that in mind and it is individualized and i want to um Definitely. one more quick question here yes. uh so this is from dave and sherry burr in texas and so i'm trying to read it on dave, my screen here. what person or event helped lead you to the path you wanted to follow or explore after your stellar olympic career Hmm. Person or event. Um, I, I would have to say a little bit 
before and a little bit after. So, so my, I almost stopped bobsledding before the Vancouver Olympics because there was so much internal, so much pol small p politics. And I'm not a very political person. And I don't like having to walk on eggshells around one person because someone else doesn't like that person. Like, I don't like that scene at all. Um, so I found it challenging, which is one reason why I never moved out to Calgary because then I only had to kind of manage it when we're on tour and I could just do my training on my own, you know, for the rest of it. So um, there was so much of it going on though. Uh, I think it was 2008. And I just, my father was at a meeting in Toronto. So he came and picked me up and we were going out for dinner. And I just received this email and I read it and I was like, this is enough. Like the mind games and that no, like it's almost like with psychological issues, you know, with that certain players in the Federation were, were doing. And I just said, you know what, you know, winning, winning a medal is not worth this psychological stuff. And I was pretty upset about it. And I said, yeah, it's not worth it. And my dad just said, oh, I just, he goes, oh, that's, he goes, yeah, okay, I, I get it. But I just never, it's weird because I never thought that this, like thought about the Olympic medals, that this was about Olympic medals. And I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, I guess I just always thought of the people you, like, especially from where I'm from, like the small province in Canada, like, I just always thought about the people you would be inspiring and motivating just from your story, like not even medals involved, but just with the pursuit. And I was like, Oh my gosh, you're right. Like it doesn't for me. And that's when I realized that when you develop those multi-level whys, if you're just doing a surface why, this is where your breaking point is. You know, you might have a breaking point here, but if you dig down a little bit, your breaking point is actually a little bit further because it's closer to home. It's closer to your values. And if you actually go all the way down, dig deep and figure out your real reason for why. And if that does align with your values and what you and where you want to go, then your breaking point, you might not have one. Like that's when you realize that you can handle a lot, like a lot more than you thought you could, because you know that you're doing exactly what you're meant to be doing. Mm -hmm. And so that's huge. That's a huge point right now, because it's huge, right? We've all suffered it. And we're all saying, can I take one more thing? Yeah. You know, for for me, three months into this, I lost a family member and then another family member. And when mm -hmm. you're in this isolated environment, this quarantine environment, and many people have gone through this, but I think the empathy for watching others go through something and you say, how am I equipping myself, mm -hmm. right? How are people that are watching this saying, how can I equip myself yeah. so that when that next thing comes, I'm not saying, ah, I got to go yeah. backwards again. Now, I do have to point out, though, that when something comes up like that, like a breaking point is there to, to raise your antennas, like to make you aware that one, either you dig down and figure out if there is another level of why and that you can like hold strong, or is it just an intentional choice to take another path? Right. Because it's not quitting if it's actually an intentional choice. You know, it's quitting if you kind of if you think you can't do it, or if you, you know, give up. And I mean, we're good at kind of lying to ourselves about that stuff. But if you actually own up and like, you know, call yourself out, then it might just be like a call to action to pivot and change. You know, it, it, that breaking point might be time to go. But if you actually dig deeper, and that also means that if you have gone to the, your base why and you're still quite, and you still wanna go, then go. But if you make the decision to go or to change path, and then if you have that feeling of regret, it's probably because you hadn't dug down to your deepest why. Like if you are sitting at your why and you're like, yep, this doesn't align. Like the reason I'm doing this is very superficial. It does not align with my values or who I am or what my family stands for, any of that stuff. So it's, it's, it's crazy. It's really important to knowing your why. Now, I mentioned my dad just in terms of shifting my perspective. I mean, he would have been supportive either way, but just kind of making me, just seeing that other side of things was just, was huge mm -hmm. to enable me to kind of keep going. Um, but in terms of like a person or an event, I would say that an event, 
I don't know that it was one, but right, that was probably to keep me going and competing. But in terms of developing a business, especially as a motivational speaker, um, and now in coaching, I think coaching has just always been ingrained in me, which is what drew me to occupational therapy, which is what, you know, drew me to doing some coach. Like, it's just been great. But the speaking part, I knew going into the Sochi Olympics that when I came out of it, I wanted to actually pursue it as a career. Because up until that point, I had just been taking in requests and doing them because I, you know, I seemed to be good at it and whatever. But leading up to Sochi, I started doing events where in which afterwards the lineups for people to you know come and speak with me and get pictures and stuff were wonderful but it wasn't just about pictures i would get questions and i would get you know almost like coaching questions all the time and how to do this and how to do this and how to do this and there was um almost every line i would get at least one person who is in tears who was holding it together you could see they were holding it together and then as soon as as soon as I, you know, said goodbye to one person and looked at them and I said, okay, then they would just start sobbing. And I just was like, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. This is when we could actually hug people still mm -hmm. before COVID. So, you know, when they came up, I would just be like, oh my gosh, come here, are you okay? And give them a hug. And they would be so apologetic. They would just say, I'm so sorry. I just, I, I'm just going through a really tough time right now. And I needed to hear what you, what you said up there. And that part really hit. And I just, it, it was those moments where I'm like, okay, it's wonderful to get a compliment saying, oh my gosh, you're such a great speaker. Thank you. I, I do appreciate those. But it's when you can affect someone viscerally and get that impact knowing that you have actually just changed someone's life. And that may sound dramatic, but in that moment, you know that you did. It is, it's a feeling that, that is an addictive feeling. That is a, that is a feeling that, is probably what fuels me in terms of doing what I'm doing. And it's crazy. There was one, I spoke at a conference in the Dominican Republic and, um, and afterwards there was a lineup for books, like for people to get books and for me to sign them and, and that sort of thing. So, but this woman kind of was off to the side and she said, I'm sorry, I can't stay. And she was just, you could see the tears all down her face. And she said, I just, I just want you to know that my husband and I are leaving directly from here for his seven week cancer treatment. And, and she's like sobbing. And she just said, and after hearing you speak, I actually think that we can get through this. And I, oh my gosh, I'm a bitch right now. I just, because we chills. I, <laughs> but you know, I that's know. when you know that you are accomplishing your why, because we always say like, if there's that one person that you can give a little bit of hope to a little bit of inspiration. Yeah. And so understanding your story is, is really critical. If people don't know your story and they go back and they say, you know, up until this point, you believed mm -hmm. that you were just going to be an occupational therapist and that yeah. you were just going to kind of go on with your life. And then it's that one thing that is in front of you, that it's always right there. And you say, okay, well, I went and tested for this mm -hmm. and then I achieved higher rates than anybody else. Yeah. And so that opened the the door to say you could potentially be in the Olympics. It's being open to, I mean, when I'm helping people kind of set goals for things, I'm adamant that even though we're setting goals and developing this plan and these action steps and everything that, that like a blueprint to help them get there, mm -hmm. it is really important for those people, for everyone to know that just because we're doing this doesn't mean you have to go all the way. Like you can choose to change direction. I don't want anyone to pursue a goal with blinders on, like, like those horses and races, you know, just seeing the next steps they have to take. Because if you do that, you may lose out on a opportunity that you never would have dreamt about before, or that you may never have even considered before. And I think for me, I obviously didn't grow up I certainly didn't dream about wearing full spandex in public for a living. So, in you the know, cold. in the freezing cold. So I do know I'm Canadian, but that does not count. Um, it is, it's just, you can't, you, you just don't know. You just, you just don't know the opportunities that are, and there are opportunities everywhere. So it's about being open to those possibilities and the opportunities that present themselves and, and being like, you know what? I just, because everybody knows I'm pursuing this, like, again, a lot of people will stick with the goal because they feel obligated, because they feel like they've, you know, they're going to let someone else down. But you really, I think we need to learn to be honest with ourselves and be like, you know what, this, 
this sounds super cool. Like I, you know, you can put this on hold or maybe it's a complete abandonment and something else. Um, and it's just, it just has to be intentional. And when you're making decisions and intentional choices, um, it just means evaluating what the cons consequences would be of either staying pros and cons or of going and pros and cons and making those intentional choices to lead it forward. I love that. And yeah. I think so many things that you talked about tonight and just telling us, you know, it's the freedom that we have to make those choices. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we forget that it is really that easy. It's right in front of us to say, yeah. uh, you don't have to continue down the road, down the path that you're going just because you're there. Right? Just because you're there. Just because and you're sometimes there. sometimes people are realizing, um, again, another anecdote in that book is this woman who she's a big shot attorney in Toronto. Um, and she doesn't really know how she got there. Like, she's like, I actually hate this, but she's like, she's crazy good and crazy famous and well-known for, you know, what she does. And she realized that because she was good at it, then she would get a promotion, which would make her feel good. And then she got, you know, an internship and then, or an apprenticeship. And then that felt good because she was getting promoted and getting these recognitions that kind of elevated her but the actual job of what she was doing was not fueling her soul, was not something that she loved to do. And so she, we, we end up sometimes getting caught up in the momentum of a path without actually stopping to give it the due diligence, like give it the consideration that it deserves in terms of seeing if we're actually on a path that we're still enjoying or whether we've just gotten caught up in it and might need to make a little shift might need to make a little shift yeah uh, do you have your medals I do um yeah do I have to go get them <laughs> do you want me to go get them yes I okay just give me a minute <laughs> okay I thought, where are they just just one second <laughs> all right so we're going to talk a little bit about Heather's challenge so while she's getting her medals because I want you to see this this is wonderful and I want her to talk about how she engages her audience when she goes and speaks uh, and she allows people the opportunity to hold the gold medals. And I think this is just amazing. So I'm going to go I back. I found them. I'm coming. I'm coming. Oh. <laughs> so, um, and her new challenge is the You Pursuit Challenge on, if you go to heathermoyes.com, you can, you can check this out and become a partner with her and she can help you, you know, get coached through all the challenges that you're faced with right now. So... Heather, if okay. I was at a conference and I would say, may I hold, may, may I hold your um, gold medal? I would say, yes. Why don't you put it on for a picture? But we're a little far away right now. <laughs> this is the medal from Vancouver. Very beautiful. Oh, oh gosh. Am I in the center here? Very beautiful. That is the medal from Vancouver. And that's the back. Oh, that's yeah, gorgeous. Shook. And it is wavy. I'll tell you about that one in a second. This is the this is where I keep my Sochi medal in a sock. <laughs> it doesn't ding. And this way, they, they the Russians they did give us a nice fancy wooden box, like a white wooden box, but a box does not fit in my purse or my yeah. carry on. So this is that, oh, that's so beautiful. Yeah. So this is the. Oh gosh, I'm trying to tilt it. Yeah, there you go. It's so beautiful. Yep. There. And that's a glass, like a little glass insert right here with etchings in it. Now, I'll just give you a little story that I sometimes talk about on my keynotes about yes. this. I don't know if we have time or not. Melanie, yes, you can just tell me to is, stop talking. No, this is so things. great. This is so okay. great. Um, I do want to say there was a question that popped up. What is my mantra? Yes. I did see that. That was from Melanie Fusilier. Mm -hmm. Okay, Melanie. Um, I have a, a few and some that were kind of, I pulled from other places. I'm a big quotes person. Love quotes. I think they can help shift your perspective and your mindset. Um, one that I developed really early on was on a card that my sister gave me. And this was right at the very start of bobsledding, testing everything. And it basically said, when nothing is sure, everything is possible. Mm -hmm. So when nothing is sure, everything is possible. So I can't take credit for that one, but I find it so powerful because it was right before tryouts and I was a rookie and I was, you know, what, like I was just, you know, we were going into testing and, you know, and, and that it was just out there when nothing is sure, meaning when nothing has happened yet, everything is still a possibility. It is still open. And so for me, that kind of was something that carried me through my very first bobsled season. 
Um, another one that I obviously have made myself, which a lot of people are aware of, is believe in the possibilities. And that's been a huge one because sometimes we only pursue things if we think we're able to do them. But if you believe in the possibilities and set goals almost higher than what you might even think, then you'll actually get farther than you would have had you just set a goal that you thought was completely possible and realistic. So this is why I encourage people to kind of push themselves and set goals. And instead of it being a finite, did you achieve it or did you not, setting something farther than you actually believe you can achieve and embracing it more like as a challenge, as a challenge to see how close you can get, that changes, that makes the world of difference. It changes your whole perspective on things because it's not about achieving or not achieving. It's like, yeah, I'm going to try. I want to I want to challenge myself and see how close I can get. And that is because I got that question a lot, especially after my hip surgery and trying to make that return to bobsledding. I mean, I get reporters saying like they were excited kind of, but do you really think you'll be able to do both rugby and, you know, really? And my answer is simple. I have no idea, but I'm, but I, I'm sure excited to see how close I can get. Like it just embrace it as a challenge. So that was a big one for me. And now it a big one that I clench, clench, clench onto, hold onto is live beyond definition. So it's about living beyond the boundaries of definition, whether it's from our past experiences, whether it's from what society thinks we should be, whether it's from whatever definition you can put on anything, whether it's our, you know, people we get defined because of our race or our gender or our, you know, our sexuality or our whatever, like live beyond that, live beyond what people assume to be associated with something and just be, yeah, I, yeah. So anyway, that's that. I, that's just a little cluster of them. <laughs> well, and we talk about this all the time. I do a devotional every morning and we talk about how consistency brings clarity, right? Mm -hmm. So consistency towards your goals, consistency towards your mindset and thinking, you know, who do I need to know? Who do I need to model after? What do I need to learn? And so if you were thinking about the next five years, right, what are you thinking about? What are you curious about learning uh, for yourself, to, for your brand, and just kind of for your life? For me personally? Mm -hmm. Well, um, hmm. let me think. Um, I am saying that kind of lightly because <laughs> I, for me, it's not so much a five-year vision partly because I do believe so many things have happened to me on roots of things mm -hmm. that I could never have predicted these past five years, let alone, I'm kind of almost at peace and accepting the fact that I have no idea what the next five years will bring. I love that. Yep. And I'm okay with that. So I think that it's not a matter of sitting directionless and not doing anything and just waiting for things to happen. But I think right now, especially with, you know, with where the coaching is going, um, and just different life decisions. I mean, even especially in Canada with, uh, with COVID and different things, it's kind of made me reevaluate, start evaluating what bubble do I want to be in? Where do I actually want to before I lived on the road all the time? So now it kind of helps you frame things. So I think that even the, the landscape of my own life and my own business is going to change. Um, but I'm kind of excited about it. I'm excited because it's kind of given me that opportunity to really dig into coaching. And I mean, I still am doing some private coaching, but by doing small groups, it's still intimate enough to be able to help individuals and tackle it, but it's, but I can reach more people. And so I might not be reaching thousands who are, you know, in an audience, but I was starting to miss that personal connection of being able to kind of help own other people's goals too, and be excited about those. So, so I don't know. That's the answer to that. Is, <laughs> no. I don't know. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I think for people that have, are just joining, um, you know, the You Pursuit Challenge is on Heather's website. So you can go mm -hmm. to heathermoyes.com uh, right here and you can sign up to be a part of this You Pursuit Challenge. Yes. Which, who doesn't want to be coached by an Olympian? Oh, it'd be so good. Oh, my goodness. Right? So Getting good. That mindset. And if people are wondering about what challenges, it is not just physical challenges. I mean, I have one woman in the current group and hers is a, it, it's a health, uh, it's a health challenge. It's kind of a two piece challenge. It's like health, happiness, that sort of thing. Um, another woman is dealing with work-life balance, wants to kind of build her business, like the reputation in her business, but also have more of a balance at home. Another woman wants to, um, 
And one woman, like I've got women in their 40s and their 50s and their 60s. So the demographic is, and it's not just women, it's not just for women, but uh, this group happens to just be women. Um, but another woman, uh, her goal is to be able to leave her job in the next, she wants it to be three years, but she said realistically five. So I'm saying redefine realistic and we'll try and see if we can do three. <laughs> um, she wants to leave her job in that amount of time and be able to earn her own income with an art studio, with her own art studio in her home. So it's really interesting that the the, the goals are are very different, but I think people are people are really learning by also watching how everyone else is is tackling those goals and breaking those goals down. And then it's like, oh, I can I get it. It becomes applicable to everything. So anyway, it's been really, really fun. Yes, but I'm going to talk about this medal just for a second. Yes. I usually do this. Now this is the Vancouver medal. So from the Olympics in 2010. And the Royal Canadian Mint spent two and a half years designing these. So um, yeah, they spent two and a half years and they actually made history in two ways. So for the first time ever, they're not flat. They're actually wavy. I don't know if you can see that. Mm -hmm. They're wavy to reflect the topography of British Columbia, which is not flat. They said that no snow or ice will ever freeze flat in that province because of the topography there. Uh, the second way they made history is that the design on the front of all 615 medals. So 615 medals were made for Vancouver and all 615 medals are different on the front of every single medal. Wow. And the reason for this, usually I have this on a slide and so I don't know, <laughs> but I have it as a folded up um, scarf. All of the medals fit somewhere in this Native American, like this First Nations oh, wow. Como U design. Beautiful. So it is really neat. And my medal actually fits right. Oh, I don't know if I can do this properly. <laughs> it's right here on the picture. Oh, wow. So yeah, so I don't know if you can see that. That is so neat. That's another reason that people need to connect to you and bring you out live so that they can touch this and they can see it for themselves. Yes. Right? Well, part of the reason they did that, though, is that they said that all Olympic medalists are forever connected in some way because they share something special, but that they all... They made the designs different on every single medal to reflect the different stories of every single athlete. So even if people have the same goal, even if they have the same, even if they work at the same workplace and have the same, you know, desired outcome as a common goal, every single person still has their own individual stories. And it's, to me, even though these are reflective of just the Olympic athletes from those games, I think it's just reflective of the world we are so especially now in these times we are so interconnected that it's what we do has an impact bigger than what we might have known known or realized before and i think it's really important to to bring that connectivity even though we're feeling a bit disconnected right now with everything going on i think we need to remind ourselves we all might have different stories but we're all still so connected it's so important you know you have taken us through such a great journey just how you've redefined everything that you believed about yourself and that there are possibilities now, right? There are so many other things that are coming and, and just opening your mind to what could be next. And I think the encouragement, you know, that people have messaged me from our original podcast, like, oh my gosh, this is so inspiring because you do get stuck. Every day mm -hmm. we get stuck in our lives and we don't think that maybe learning something new is going to equip us with things that, that we need to do to move it forward. And yeah. like, I don't have the money, time, energy, you know, resources, then you need to figure out what that one thing is that can move you forward in that one area. Yeah. And then it'll get a little bit easier and a little bit mm -hmm. easier. Um, but the mindset, you know, us as John Maxwell coaches and, and you're part of the JMT DNA, as we say, mm -hmm. um, and I want you, before we leave, I want you to share that story about, you know, your experience with John Maxwell. You shared this on the podcast, but I just love it. When I met John? Yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so when I met John, I'm assuming all your listeners know who John is, John yeah, Maxwell. John Maxwell, yes. <laughs> um, yeah. So I was hired to open for him at an event in Canada and it was a three-part day. Uh, the first part was in front of 6,000 students and high school students in a coliseum. Uh, the lunch time was um, for a, it was a private 
like a VIP session for like the premiers, mayors, CEO, like CEOs of some big companies and stuff. So it was, it was a more intimate feel. And then those leaders all kind of amalgamated into an afternoon session, which was also with business and community leaders who could pay to attend the afternoon sessions. And I was hired to speak about half the amount of time of John for each of the sessions. So I think the morning session he spoke for, I don't know, 50 minutes. So I was scheduled to speak for 25. And then in the lunch one, I think I spoke for 15 because he spoke for half an hour. And then the afternoon one was a longer one. So anyway, that that was that. And so we kind of did all this stuff. And then, and then John uh, came up after. And we'd been talking at lunch and talking in the morning and kind of throughout the, throughout the day just chit-chatting. And then he, he comes up after. And he just says, uh, I hear speakers all the time. And very rarely do I hear a speaker who connects as well to an audience and especially different audiences that, as you do. Um, he said, I'd love to mentor you. And I said, I said, okay. And he handed me his, like, he just said, here, take my, cell, take my number. Here's my cell phone number. Take it in your phone. And I was like, okay. So I put his number <laughs> in my phone. I had no idea who John was. So I have, I didn't come from a from a like a company background or employment background where I was, you know, reading leadership books or you know I was I guess living leadership instead of you know reading about it and it was really interesting because beforehand I I don't usually open for somebody I'm usually a closing keynote so I all I need to know usually is the theme of a conference and then talk to the organizers in terms of what this group is facing right now in terms of challenges so that I can make it personal. But this time, because I was sharing the stage with John, I just, I said, okay, well, what does this guy talk about? Mm -hmm. And so they said, well, he's an author. So just Google John Maxwell author. And I was like, okay. So I Googled John Maxwell author and I saw like 80 books on leadership. So I just skimmed the titles and kind of to get a sense of what he talked about. I had no idea. So when he gave this to me, I just thought, oh, thanks for the compliment. Like, you know, I really appreciate it. That's, that's great. Two days later, I sent him a message and I just said, you had mentioned um, mentorship. I've never had a mentor before. I don't know what that, what would that entail? And he said, oh, that's, he goes, well, we could do it any different ways. You could just text me or call me if you have any questions or, you know, we could arrange a call every once in a while or what, you know, whatever you think you might need. And he said, but I would really love it if you could come, I'm doing a coaching, there's an event, like a conference event or something down in Florida um, in a few months. And I would love it if you could sign up, not necessarily to take the course, but just to, to come, I would love my staff to meet me. And I was like, this guy is a staff. Like I, I was like, who is this guy? I don't, I don't, what's going on. So I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll take a look at the course and I'll, I'll sign up and I'll come down. So I signed up for this course. And then I was like, let's look into this a little bit more. And then I, that's when I realized that he has like an empire and he like, you know, is, is coaching and, and leading some of the top leaders in the world. Um, and I was just, I guess I feel very blessed that a lot of people I've met in my life, I've met without knowing what they do or who they are to the world. I've been able to kind of meet them as who they are as people, as opposed to you know, how the world sees them. And it was really great when I got down to Florida and I, you know, went to, went to lunch, went to lunch with, um, uh, with he and his staff and, and that sort of thing. And then people were coming up to me like, oh my gosh, how do you know John? And I was just like, I, I'm just, a, just a friend. Like I, you know, I don't, I didn't know how to deal with, with that because I did, I hadn't seen him that way. Mm -hmm. And so it was really, it was really just a, yeah, it was a real blessing to be able to meet him in that way and then to just become, to become friends. So it's been really great. I, uh, you know, one of the things that we always teach is right. Meeting people where they are. So when you said yes. that, I love this because so yeah. many times we, we try to change something or we change a situation and we say, well, but I want to only go meet them because they're a celebrity. Right. But what can they do to get on my level and how can I really just meet mm -hmm. them and, and experience them and their life? And that's what I love about you is you really take that on as I am living my life this way. This is what I believe. And Simon Sinek is one of those that I follow mm -hmm. all the time. Yeah. And he did this video the other day and it said, you know, you you really should be doing business only with those people who believe what you believe. When you Fair. when you know your why and you understand what your beliefs are, like you, 
you can become a champion in everything that you're mm-hmm. doing in your life, right? And if if for some reason you test and you are qualified to to try out for the Olympics, then go do that. If you are, if you want to, right. If you want to, if you're challenged with anything else in your life, you can accomplish those goals. It's just be open to those possibilities like you've taught us. And, um, your soul is amazing. I just want to tell you, you. I just absolutely love you. And I, I can't wait to be able to come up and give you a big hug. Oh, I know. (laughs) I know. Um, And I want to, I want to really encourage people, right? I've shown them the website. I'm going to go back here real quick before we sign off, because I know you um, are giving us a lot of time tonight and I really appreciate it. But your website, heathermoyes.com, for anyone that is looking to have a challenge with a great coach, uh, you can right now go and sign up for her You Pursuit Challenge and uh, get onto her website and connect to Heather and to be able to, you know, when we get back after COVID, you can have her come to an event or do a virtual yes. event um, yeah. because you can reach out and touch her medals, which mm. I, <laughs> is a great thing. You know, if you have a, a kid's event, if you have a youth event, um, this would be a great opportunity Uh, for you to help them get inspired with their life and knowing that you can make those choices uh, that can really define what those possibilities are. So yeah, um, I do have to say that most adults turn into kids when they get those medals on. Yeah, Yeah, it's really great. Can you hold one up right for us again? (laughs) I know the other one's in the sock. Yes, yes, yes. (laughs) Oh, beautiful. Those are gorgeous, Heather. Congratulations. They're scratched. They've been loved. They've been passed around and loved by a lot of people. So um, it's been really great. That's been the best part is having been able to, you know, spread that um, around because I feel like these medals um, are a tangible representation of people's goals, regardless of what they are. It's kind of representative of what we can accomplish when we put our minds to it. So, Uh, yeah. Any last words for us? Oh my goodness. No, live beyond definition. We'll leave it with that. Live, live beyond definition. Live beyond definition. Mm -hmm. You heard it here. Believe in the possibilities. Thank you. Thank you for being an everyday leader. Thank you for being so gracious with your time and inspiring us to really reach out and figure out what it, what it looks like for us, what those possibilities in our life can be. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me, Melanie. You're welcome. Keep us posted. Come back anytime and share with us what you're what's happening on your journey. Love it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a great